what people will. Okay, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about Pesach because I want to be like Sobeez. You know how Sobeez is on the ball and is ready for Pesach way before Pesach even comes. In fact, when does Sobeez really start to prepare? Because like that is the Jewish calendar. If you take a look and you want to know when the holidays are, just walk into Sobeez. It'll give you a hint. So when does Sobeez start to prepare for Pesach? Anybody? Right what? Right off the Purim. Like straight after, like even before, did you notice all those white shelves coming in? <laughs> okay, so you know what, Sobeez is very smart because in all honesty, right, the Torah tells us that Pesach and Purim are extremely connected holidays. Now that's, that's an interesting thing. So let me explain to you how extremely connected. Next year is a leap year. So if you ever look at a Jewish leap year, if you were a Jewish woman, right, and there are two months of Adar, right, and then there's Pesach after, any Jewish woman would elect to have Purim be in the first month of Adar, so we could have this like really long, long break to get ready for Pesach. But what happens, the Torah tells you that Purim has to be in the second month of Adar, the second month of that leap year of Adar, so that it will be right next to Pesach, because Purim and Pesach are very connected. So to Sobeez, they're connected by one thing, prophets. Purim, Pesach, and prophets are all connected to um, uh, each other in Sobeez's eyes. Because, you know, what they're thinking is, look, we got to move this fast and we want to get ahead of all the competition. But if you took a break for a second in your mind, like think for a second, I want to ask you, how do you look and see that Purim and Pesach have a lot in common? So let's hear it. People unmute, okay, it's unmute. How do you see Purim and Pesach? Good, look at Bar Hashem, so many people are coming. How Hi. do you see Purim and Pesach? Well, are you Pesach, oh, uh, sorry, I thought you were going to say Purim and Yom Kippur. No, Purim and Pesach. How do you see them as similar holidays? You were saved by Hashem. Oh, okay, you know what, Leora, thank you. Okay, so we, number one, we were saved by Hashem. What was the threat? annihilate all the Jews. Yeah, in both situations. Okay, like people should know, like we always talk about it, like um, historically Hitler, Yamach Shemo, took a lot of Paro's concepts to destroy the Jewish people. Like he studied this, it's an interesting reality. He really studied it, right? So the idea of making them slaves, the idea of making them work, like in bizarre places, like to work, to feel like you're a nothing. None of the work was purposeful, right? They would take rocks from one place and put it to the other place. So let's say in Egypt, they would make them build these cities, right? Pisos and Ramses, but they built them on quicksand. So everything would just fall apart right after you finish building it. So this idea to make you feel, right? No meaning, no purpose, like just, you know, you're, you're worth nothing, you're worthless. So he, they really understood each other. Okay, so that's a very big connection. There's a big um, liberation, a big celebration, a big salvation of the Jewish people. Now, I want you to know something about the story of Purim. The most important part of the story takes place on Pesach. Okay, like what is she talking about? But this is what it is, all right? When we talk about Haman, like it talks about it in the Megillah, it actually gives you references to when certain things are happening. So it talks about it in the Megillah and it says that Purim, uh, sorry, that on the hot, like on, in the story, Haman makes a poor, which means a lottery, right? He's trying to find the best date in the world to kill the Jews. Right. That's what he's looking to do. And they say that he does a lottery on the 12th of Nisan. OK, Nisan is the month of the holiday of Pesach. The Jewish people already are celebrating this holiday of Pesach during the story of Purim. Right. Pesach is way before Purim. It's written in the Torah like you have to eat matzah. You have to do this. So this has been a holiday the Jewish people know about for hundreds and hundreds of years. Right. So here they are living in Persia. Meanwhile, Haman is making a lottery, picks a date to annihilate the Jews, goes to King Ahasuerus, tells him, I'll buy you off. This, let's just wipe these people out, right? And they send out a letter that they are going to destroy all the Jewish people 
almost a year later, right? On the 13th of Adar, right? But meanwhile, Mordechai and the Jewish people find out that they are going to be annihilated. So when are they finding out? They're finding out on the 13th of the month of Nisan of that year. So now Mordechai is walking around in sackcloth and looking miserable and, and, and is miserable, doing tshuva and realizing like there's a threat of annihilation here, right? And he dresses up in sackcloth and someone comes and tells Esther, who's sitting in the palace, she doesn't even know about any of this, right? So she has a communication with Mordechai and Mordechai tells her, you know, we're all going to be annihilated and you have to go to the king, you have to help, you have, this is why Hashem put you here. And she's going, what? Well, if that's the case. If that's the case, then in this year, there will be no Pesach. You will all fast for me for three days. So that means they fasted air of Pesach, the first night of Pesach, and the second night of Pesach. So that is in many ways really connects the story of Purim to Pesach. Because the salvation ends up coming, right? After that comes all those silly parties that she makes. The whole story is happening. Like the whole climax of the story, right? Is all happening over the holiday of Pesach. In the end, when seven, when the 10 sons of Haman are hanged, it's also on Pesach. Like it's a really, you know, interesting reality. So the first month of the year, of the Jewish calendar year, the first month, okay, is the month of Nisan, okay? That's when the first month starts, okay? That's Nisan. The last month of the calendar year is Adar, is the month of where the Purim story ends up. Like, in other words, the Jewish people are saved. The 10 sons are killed, but it takes almost a year for them to send out new letters, right, all across the 127 provinces that give the Jewish people permission to fight against their enemies and that no non-Jew, like not like a mass rally of non-Jews able to kill them. Do you see what's going on? But the crux of the story, the real salvation of the story happens over Pesach of that year. So you see how they're so, so connected. So Leora is right. There's a great connection in this that God saves them. But let's think of more connection. Okay, I want to see more connection. So you should know both holidays, the real heroes of the nation, right, are the Jewish women in both holidays, okay? So in the holiday of Purim, it's Esther, Right. And in the holiday of Pesach, really, the biggest heroes are really Shifra and Pua. Right. Those are really who is it? Yochevet and Miriam. They're the real heroes. Because what did we say about the men during that time? It was getting so dark and so bleak that the men said, like, let's give up. We don't need to get married. We don't need to do anything anymore. In fact, let's get divorced because every time we're having a child, he's just being killed. Right. And then it's Miriam who says to her father, Amram, like, how could you be doing this? You're not only destroying the Jewish people, you know, the way Paro is that you're killing the boys, you're killing us off altogether. You have to have a Muna, right? And be in a Geula. Okay. Now, Esther, it's interesting. When you look at Esther, she sees it at the end. You know, first, it's extremely scary because Esther really. Her sacrifice is the ultimate sacrifice. Even when you think about Miriam and Yecheved and these, at the end, they're all part of the happy story. They're not left behind in Egypt. They get to march out with everybody else. Do you know what I mean? But this Esther, Nebuch doesn't, right? Esther ends up being stuck in the palace. Yet Esther has the sense to say, you know what, forget it. It doesn't matter. Like my job now what do I have right here, right now? Like, I'm not going to worry about the future. I'm not going to, you know, do you know what's it called? Uh, be held back. Oh my gosh, in the past, I had it so good. Like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not putting myself there. What am I, what's the mitzvah of the moment, right? So the mitzvah of the moment is to do the right thing right here and right now. And what's interesting is she tells the Jewish people to do this very spiritual like, 
do the very the right spiritual things like pray, give charity, and what's it called, and do chuba and repent, right? But then she goes and she invites Haman to a party. Do you know what I mean? So when the Jewish people are looking at that, they're like, what is she doing? And what do they think that she's doing? What do they look, what do they look at her as? What do they look at her as when they, they're watching that she's like inviting Haman to a party with Ahasuerus? What, what is, what's the Jewish people thinking at that point? She's a traitor. Yes, excellent, excellent. So what does she keep trying to get the Jewish people to do? She's trying to prove to them, and it's a very interesting idea that, you know, what you need is amuna, bitachon, geula. Like, you know, this is the Aleph Beis Gimel that Rabbi Rubashkin made very famous, right? Amuna, bitachon, and geula. And that's what he, she's saying. So it's an interesting idea. Like, I just think that we need to appreciate this. The same with the Jewish people in Mitzrayim. You know, we talk about this idea, like, you know, you need to make your own effort, you know, like, this is the big problem in Judaism, like, how much is it that we rely on God? And how much is it that we, you know, we go to work and work for how many hours a day, 27 hours, 25 hours, three hours, like, how much, you know, everyone's always very confused with this. This is probably one of the most confusing things we have in Judaism is how much physical, real effort do you make? Right, you want to get your daughters married, okay? Do you call five thousand shabchanim? Look up every single you know website online. Call five hundred people. Like, what is it? Or do you just say, okay, you know what, Hashem, I trust you. I'm going to do reasonable hishtadlos. Like, what is going on here? So I think what the, these two holidays are trying to prove to you is that just as important, like, and it's important for us to really get this one, is just as important as it is to do the physical hishtadlus, the, the physical effort towards getting your geula, getting your redemption, you need to appreciate that you have to have amuna and bitachan at the same time. Those are big buttons that change reality. So as much as Esther went to Achashverosh and tells him over the story and gets him all jealous and, and catches Haman off guard, the real reality pusher, right? Like they say, it's like there's an expression in Yiddish, when you're sick, you should have pay and tehillim. What does that mean? You should drink a little bit of tea, meaning like you take your medicine, but you better not forget your tehillim, okay? So this is something that we have to understand. Like that's what Esther is trying to prove. That's what Hashem is trying to prove. Because as much as he's bringing these heroes to save the day, right? So let's say he brings Moshe and Aaron. But the kinds of like supernatural feats that these guys did, nobody attributed it to them. Nobody said because, you know, Aaron uh, lifts up his stick and hits the ground and now a frog comes, that it was Aaron's magic that brought the frog. He was saying, this isn't me, this is God. I'm just doing this action to facilitate God's, um, what's it called, partnership with me. But part of that partnership with Hashem is whatever you're doing, you have to take Amuna Bitachon with you, okay? So it's not like... I believe I have to do this and then God's going to help. No, it's I believe, right, that God gave me a mitzvah in a natural world to try to do some natural um, effort. But the truth is the amunah and bitachon is all that really gets me past the finish line, right? Like if this is blessed or this is not blessed, this is God. You know what I mean? And, and he not only does he want me to do the physical effort, he wants me to tap in to this amuna and this bitachon because both stories, right, were crazy. They both were crazy. Like we have to we have to appreciate them. They're both as much as like you know we we call um, Mitzrayim getting out of Egypt a very obvious miracle. It is okay, like because nature was you know flipped on its lid. But in all reality, when you look in hindsight at the story of the Megillah, it's also an incredible miracle. 
Like that this whole thing should time out the way it timed out, right? That Esther becomes the, the queen and that, you know, um, Haman hates Mordechai more than anyone else. Mordechai never gives up, right? Never bows down to him. And because of that, he's so angry and crazy. You know, he's making all kinds of mistakes. Do you see what I'm saying? Every little like nuance in the story, Mordechai overhears, you know, these people plotting to kill the king uh, or Achishverosh can't sleep, like all these things. Do you know what I mean? Like we have to appreciate like, have to appreciate so that's what Hashem is trying to show us and this is what we have to really gather strength with because what's the headache <laughs> lack of a you know a, a less honest word what's the headache that comes up right now between Purim and Pesach like let's be very honest call a spade a spade what's the headache now you could say it say it claiming yeah, hundred yeah. percent. This is not a joke. Like you know, everybody loves all those jokes. Like we're not really free. The Jewish woman is still in slavery. You know, like we like to talk like that because it, because from the outside, it definitely looks like that. Like I'm like you know, like I, like I, I don't even like honestly want to think about it. But but the truth is, I know. Like you know. You know, right after Pesach, the next day I go, I mean, after Purim, it's like, no big deal. Pesach's really far. But then, like, let's say this Shabbos, you already bless this new month. Okay, now you're blessing Nisan. Rosh Chodesh is coming, you know, a week from this Thursday. Like, by Rosh Chodesh, you got it. You really should have your act pretty much together. You know what I mean? Like, you should know at least which direction you're going in. And it's hard. It's really, really hard. So, there's a few things that we need to do, like we need to know, which is very, very important, that this whole cleaning business and taking care and doing, you know, buying the right food and getting rid of your chametz is really a big mitzvah. Like, it's not something that, you know, it's not like, oh, stupid cleaning, you know, or like, oh, I have to go buy all this stuff. Like, it's not it's a mitzvah. It's not just something cute. Okay. So it's a real mitzvah, right? It's a mitzvah to have matzah and it's a mitzvah to not have chametz. So the whole time that you are doing everything that you're doing, right? You're really getting all your air miles to heaven, right? But you don't want to lose them because the Torah tells you like, you know, when you regret it or you say it's stupid or you're not doing it for the right reasons, then you're not really collecting anything except for, you know, um, calluses on your hands okay, and very bad nails. All right, that's what's happening, right? So we want to understand like, what are we doing here? So you, we need to have like Amuna bitachon geula. Okay, so we need to go like this. You know, Hashem, you know, this is the mitzvah you gave us. I want to do it with a smile. Okay, I don't want to do it like all like frustrated and crazy and all this. I'm not interested in that. I really want to have Amuna and bitachon geula. You're going to help me. This isn't going to, like, I'm going to go shopping to the store and you'll help me find whatever it is I need. And if it's not there, then you're telling me I don't need it. And that's it. And I'll let it go. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, this is a time of not just physically preparing. You're trying to figure this all out emotionally and spiritually. And I really feel like it's not such a simple time. I'm very glad, like, Baruch Hashem, we're lucky. Like, we're not under, you know, terrible you know, problems, we're able to make a Seder, we're able to go to Sobeys, like, it's not like it's so tough, right, today you can get uh, Koshal Pesach pizza crust and <laughs> pishka and anything you ever wanted and noodles, <laughs> nobody's like really suffering, okay, let's like, be real, okay, this isn't, you know, Mrs. Uh, Hachman with one matzah and whatever, okay, this is a full array of a whole bunch of stuff, but if this is a time, like a real time, what does it mean to work on your amuna and your bitachon? There's a lot of character traits that get trampled on here. There's a lot of frustration. Who's invited? Who isn't invited? Who's coming to the Seder? Who's not coming to the Seder? Then when you're at the Seder, this aunt is so loud and this uncle is a, a bore and this one is, you know what I'm trying to say? Like, there's a lot going on, much more than just meets the eye of buying a box of matzah, right? So that's something that we need to be thinking about. Like Amuna Bitachon Geula. Amuna Bitachon Geula is not only on a national scale. Like, yay, the Jewish people are going to be freed and this is the best time. Amuna Bitachon Geula is also for you personally, right? Like this is a time that you got to be thinking about yourself, right? 
right? Like, how am I going to deal with this? And like, you know, family dynamics, very touchy during Pesach, who's going to whose house and why she had this one and be this, you know, like I, I want my daughter, no, my daughter has to go with her, you know, husband to the in-laws, like, you know what I mean? Like all this kind of stuff, you can really lose it. Like, if you really think about it, you know how you can lose it so badly at this time of year. So we should have to really appreciate like, uh, no, like whatever you're doing, the purpose of these two holidays is to get close to a chef. No, I'm being real. Is to really be looking at like, I want a relationship with you, God, and ain't owed no bado. And even when like you see every time the Jewish people are off what we call the haktitzeris, like they're in really bad place, you will be there for them. You will be there for me. Okay, so uh, I was watching something. I can't remember his first name, but he is a terrible Russia, like a real living. You know, we sometimes think like, you know, you hear the story of Haman or Hitler, you march and you like, no, nobody could be like such a Russia. So Farrakhan, has anybody heard of who Farrakhan is? So he's like a black um, African-American preacher. Okay, so he has this thing called the Church of Islam. Okay, so the Church of Islam, their arch enemy is the Jews. And he publicly, like, it's unbelievable to think that in, you know, North America, he can stand up and publicly spew the most anti-Semitic rhetoric you could ever imagine. Like, he could never say that about any other ethnic group. It's only about us. But I'm talking about today. I'm talking about he spoke, I think, a couple days ago. All right. We're not talking about, you know, I'm not talking about 1946. I'm talking about in 2023. He gets up. I, I, like, I cannot believe the stuff he was saying. I was listening. The stuff that he was saying was beyond anything. He was saying that um, the Jews are the synagogue of Satan. And they say never again, like they'll never be burned again. Little do they know they're all going to be burned. Like it was unbelievable. And he's going on and on and on about, you know, all the troubles that are in the world today and the banks that are failing and everything else. It's all because of Jewish power. We own everything. He's, it was literally, I could not believe it. And like we and lend money, like it was all the most old anti-Semitic garbage, garbage that the most unsophisticated, you know, Polish boor, you know, who drank his head off and, you know, had nothing but vodka 24 seven would be running around saying, but you know what the scary part was? He has a followings of tens of thousands of people. And they show the audience and the audience is going, yeah, yeah. like it was crazy. Right. So what's the purpose of this? The purpose of this is what the Torah tells you. The story of Purim, the story of Pesach. Time is a very interesting reality in Judaism. Time is not like this fleeting, you know, oh, once upon a time, the three bears, and once upon a time, King Achashverosh. No, no. The Torah tells you all of this reality, all of the energy, the spiritual energy, the emotional energy, the physical energy, it all comes around with every new Jewish year and new Purim that you celebrate this Purim and the new Pesach that you celebrate this Pesach. The energies of the past are all here. So that energy of tapping in to Amuna and Bitachon is Geula is right here at our fingertips. We, we have to make a conscious effort to really get into it, right? So like when I was watching that today, like all I want to do is shut it off. Like I just didn't even want to see it. I was like, I cannot believe. I really, I was like hard to believe that this is like right here, right now. Like it was cuckoo, right? So either you're going to watch that and go, or you're going to watch that and go, you know what, Hashem? It's a little bit of a wake up call. <laughs> right like we got to get back on track right Pesach isn't about kvetching <laughs> yeah. like not in a mean way and Pesach isn't about your mother's favorite matzo ball recipe like yeah it's a beautiful thing and you bring your mother's favorite matzo ball recipe into the Seder you do it's beautiful because you know what that reminds you of that this is a link a chain that goes all the way back to when the Jewish people came out of Egypt so you really belong to something very big 
right? And look how beautiful Hashem does it. You know, there's, you know, when you have books and you have the first book and the last book, it's the same thing with your family. You have the oldest and you have the youngest, right? Then you have all the people in between. That first and that last, they're called the bookends, right? And they kind of are the border that represents everything that's in the middle, right? So that's what's going on here, right? Purim and Pesach, Hashem said, oh, they're very, very connected. And really every holiday, right? All the stuff that's coming in the middle, Shavuos and Sukkot and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and we have so much, and Hanukkah, like, what don't we have? Like, we could be, you know, it's the biggest bracha in the world, what we have. What's God saying? It's all Amuna Bitachon Geula, Amuna Bitachon Geula, Amuna Bitachon Geula. Now, look, when you look at Rabbi Rabashkin, yeah, he came up with that slogan, right? Amuna Bitachon and Geula. But guess what? He sat in prison for eight years. Right? It's not Amuna and Bitachon Geula, <laughs> and we're all done and it's over and everything's hunky dory. No. Amuna Bitachon Geula is, I gotta hold on, 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 I gotta hold on till my very last breath. Right? Right? That's the way it goes, right? And in the stories, things go up and things go down and things go up and things go down and then they finished and we're done and we're finished. No more up and down. We come to the final salvation. But these are the kinds of thoughts you have to have, right? While we are preparing and we have to realize in the story that the greatest superhero, who remembers like watching Superman when they were much younger? <laughs> Anybody remember watching Superman in black and white on channel seven? <laughs> All right. So it was like in black and white, right? And what was so interesting was like Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen, they always knew somehow they'd be in trouble and then suddenly you'd see Superman <laughs> comes in, right? Right, like one of them would run to the phone booth and pop. <laughs> Right. Oh no, it was Clark Kent would run into the phone booth and he would change into Superman. Okay, and then he saved them, right? So what we have to do is we have to realize that you have a Superman. You have a Shem. And he may not save you the way you wanted, but he's saving you. He's never going to let you go completely. He's not, because that's not who he is. And it may be, right, like you don't understand it. And there's things that happen that none of us will ever understand until later. Remember, we said that about the Parsha, right? That Hashem said, you will never be able to understand me fully. You, you can't. You just don't have the mental capacity. You're not beyond, like, I am the past, the present, and the future right here and right now, all in one. You, you can't see that way, right? So you'll only be able to see me sometimes in hindsight and may not be in hindsight right, while you're alive on this planet, that hindsight may be after, like when you're only a soul, and then you're not be, then you're not restricted by body, and you're not restricted by time, do you know what I'm saying? So this is what we have to feel, we have to, like, that's what you're working on now, you're working on, the Jewish people looked like they were doomed, right, they looked like they were doomed by Pesach. They looked like they were doomed by Purim. There were people in the story who said, we will never give up. We're not going to give up our Muna and Bitochon, and it's going to come to a time of Geula. And that's what exactly happened, right? And the Jews end up, by the story of Purim, they say, we accept the Torah when we're coming. Like, we're sorry, we flew off the handle. We're back on track. We're back on track. And the Jewish people who leave Egypt say, yeah, we're getting out of here and we're going to be this new Jewish nation and we're staying stuck to you. So these are all incredible and beautiful ideas, but you have to have, you know, it's an interesting thing. Like you have to have a certain, what's the word here? It's called a, a lev chacham. You have to have a wise heart. You know, it's interesting because What's the difference between a good old fashioned heart and a wise heart? What do I mean? Like, what do you think the Torah means when it says that kind of um, adjective to somebody? Like, that's a person with a wise heart, a lev chacham. You know, you could just say, well, that's a person with a good heart or that's a person with a heart. What's the difference? Amita, you want to he, he, he has... The person has learned with experience or? Okay, okay. you can say the person has learned with experience. What have they learned with experience when it comes to the heart? Like, what is the wisdom? 
what's a wise heart? Because what's the problem with a heart, generally speaking? Like when we talk about, you know, if you look at it in secular poetry or songs, hell, I just love you, I can't help it. You know what I mean? All this kind of stuff, right? So what, what's the, you know, the, the secular version of a heart is what? Very emotional. Yes, beautiful. Very emotional. Emotional without being very rational right like a lev chacham means an emotional heart that is still rational okay so i'm going to just tell you a story it's a very nice story from Rav shlomo zalman orbach okay so Rav shlomo zalman orbach so he's one of the great great uh torah giants he lived what he, i think he probably passed away maybe 20 years ago it was a great great rabbi he was at that time when he was in his prime then he was like the leader of the jewish people lived in the land of israel he was the one people went to for questions and brachas and an amazing amazing guy so they said about him that he had a lev chacham he had that kind of wise heart so here's two stories okay so when he was a you know <laughs> these people bar hashem they lived to be at least 100 right but when let's say he was in his 70s okay so when he was in his 70s um he was invited to a wedding all right now usually like he was very renowned even at that point and you know one of the great honors of a wedding when who is being masader kedushin who's that the person who kind of is you know leading the whole wedding you know when you're 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 seeing the chuppah and you see the rabbi who is masader kedushin he's pointing things out he's telling people what to do he's giving certain brachas like that is considered the highest um what would I say, honor that you could have at the wedding. Okay, so he was just going to this wedding and he knew before he went, he was not the Masada Kedushin. He was not, and he wasn't upset about it. He just, he knew the family and the guy who was getting married, he wanted his Rosh Yeshiva. He wanted his rabbi to be the Masada Kedushin. Who was this man? His name was Rabbi Beryl Peransky. Today, he is a great Rosh Yeshiva of the, I think it's of the Panovich Yeshiva, great, you know, Rosh Yeshiva, the Panovich Yeshiva today. But when he was then, he was like a young guy, like he, you know, he had, you know, created a Yeshiva, but it was new and he was young, right? So they, you know, he's, he comes to the wedding, right? And he was ready to be this Masader Kedushin, right? He was ready to be the so-called rabbi master of ceremonies, right? He's ready to do it, but then he looks up and he sees Rav Z like Shlomo Zalman Orbach is there, who is like far surpasses him, okay? So can you imagine once upon a time, like we had this kind of respect for people? It's Amita, you would for sure know. <laughs> <laughs> on a different league, the Svardi community, different league when it comes to rabbi. But the Ashkenazi community, not so, you know what I mean? So he sees Shlomo Zalman Orbach and he almost faints. Like he, he goes running over to him. He says, there's no way I am not going to be the Masader Kedushin at this wedding. Like, absolutely not. You are the much, you know, more elder rabbi. You're the more pristine rabbi. There's no way. I'm not doing it. So Shlomo Zalman Orbach says, no, no, you don't understand. The chassan wants you. He's connected to you. They didn't ask me. They asked you. And he said, no, I can't. I just can't. I can't. And he said, Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Orbach said to him, then I think I'll just go home. So this Rabbi Beryl Peransky realized like, no, no, I can't do that either. Because okay, that will make everybody. So he said, you know what? Okay, so I understand. Okay, I'll do it. Like it was, it was very hard for him and he did it. Okay, so now fast forward now, whatever, 15 years has gone by. Okay, 15 years goes by. So Rabbi Beryl Peransky calls up Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach. And he says, you know, there's a boy in my yeshiva and he just got engaged to this lovely girl and it's like a beautiful shidduch but there's a, a problem there may be a problem and I'm a little worried so I want to come to speak to you personally okay so he gets on a bus this Rabbi Bale um, Perensky goes all the way to Shalayim to Shlomo Zalman Orbach 
And he comes to me, tells him over the story that there is some kind of question. They're afraid that this boy may not be Jewish. You know, like they end up finding out something about the relatives that could be the grandmother was never a Jew. Like, do you know what I mean? It's like a big scandal. He's about to get married to this, you know, big rabbi's daughter. <laughs> that would not be a good surprise. <laughs> so that would not be a good surprise, right? So he goes to Roshlomo Zalman Orbach and Roshlomo Zalman Orbach says to him, you know what? I've checked everything. I see everything you gave me. I'm looking into this. I'm making phone calls, blah, 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 calls him back. And he says, you have nothing to worry about. He is 100% perfect kosher boy. You have nothing to worry about. Fine. And this Ribeiro Peransky was going to be the Masader Kedushin. <laughs> he gets to be the, you know, again, the, the master of ceremonies for this, for this wedding. Okay. So the wedding's, the day of the wedding comes and everybody's there. We dressed up, everything's this. And Ribeiro, and Ribeiro Peransky standing there by the door and in walks, who? Of Shlomo Zalman Orbach. He wasn't even invited. <laughs> it was invited. And Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach walks in and he says, I need to be the Masader Kedushin. And this Rabbeiro Peransky goes, You know what, Rav Shlomo Zalman, I don't understand you. <laughs> Last time, 15 years ago, I was a little punky guy. <laughs> I told you I don't want to be the Masada Kedushin. You should be the Masada Kedushin. And I know you're not even invited to this one. <laughs> so why have you showed up to be the Masada Kedushin? He said, you know why I showed up? Because if I'm the Masada Kedushin and I told everyone that this boy is Jewish and there's nothing to worry about, no one's going to talk. If you do it, they're still going to say, well, who's Ribeiro Perensky? You know, the real Gadol Hador is Rav Shlomo Zalman Orbach. And how do we know he really said it? So you know how they're all going to know I really said it? I'm going to be right here and I'll be the master of ceremonies. And this way we will save a lot of pain for this couple. So that's called a Lev Chacham, right? What is it? Their ego isn't in the story. It's not about their ego at all. They don't care less about their ego. And it's not about the past. And it's not about the future. It's about the right here and the right now. And that's what we're all going to, like, I'm, I know it. Like, I, like, <laughs> like, you know, Hashem just gives you these different challenges that we need to grow from. And during this time from Purim, I'm going to be honest, almost till the end of Pesach, like I'm being real. Like, it just is a more intensified time it just is it just is you're, you're going to be with more people you have to clean more work more like you're going to have a harder workload so whatever stress we had before like we're just gonna you know like how i'm so stressed we're gonna be a little more okay <laughs> right so the question is how are we going to take it? Because I don't want to waste it. I don't know about you either. Like, I don't want to be, you know, doing this stuff going, oh, I'm so mad. This is so stupid. Like, I remember once listening to uh, Rebbitz and Esther Bela Schwartz, and she said it so beautifully. Like, we think we have it bad with parking and stuff like that in Sobeys. Multiply it by 5 million in places like Borough Park, Muncie, and New York. You know, places where it's really heavily concentrated with Jews, and you can't park on this side of the street and it's very narrow and there's a million school buses like she says people you could be fuming in your car right so she said like you know you get into the grocery store and this one's pushing and this one needs this and this one's asking you this and then somebody hits you with the cart behind you so she said you know what she does she says Parash. <laughs> you know thank god there's lots of jews thank god there's still people who even care about pesach you know thank god thank god we're here thank god this thank god that you know what I'm saying? That's like Amuna Bitachon Geula. Thank God I have family to worry about who's going to the in laws and who's going into the Shmin laws. You know what I mean? Like, thank God, thank God, thank God, thank God that these are our problems. These are our mitzvahs. You know, these are our incredible opportunities, right? To develop this Amuna Bitachon and Geula. That's really interesting. Torah tells you like this close your eyes for a second. Of course, I do. Okay, close your eyes for a second. And if I said, I'm going to give you freedom, okay, I'm giving you freedom. Now, freedom. Okay, now let's all be really honest. Okay, open your eyes. Tell me what you saw. What was your picture? 
of freedom. What was your picture of freedom? You could tell me, I know mine is <laughs> the Bahamas. No, okay. Yeah. <laughs> What's your picture of freedom? Amita, no more, no mortgage. <laughs> no mortgage. Amen. <laughs> That's good. What else? No, you're being real. What else? What else? Anybody else want to like? No worries for retirement. No, no, no worries for retirement. Like for me, it's vacation. Okay. No worries about anything. Okay. It's just snorkel, snorkel, snorkel. That's it. Okay. That's what we kind of look at as freedom. All right. So it's just interesting. So they say the matzah represents freedom. Isn't that funny? Now take a look and think about matzah. Tell me one thing that's free about matzah. It's the most complicated little cracker you've ever seen, okay? You gotta do it in like less than 18 minutes and you can't have the water on it too long and they have to roll it really fast and they throw it in the ovens and, and everybody has to wash their hands every five seconds, the exact opposite. Like I'm being real. If anything, you would say chametz is freedom. Why? Because after I make the bread, what do I do? It's the rise it's on its own and do nothing. Okay. <laughs> I'm not killing it the way I'm with the matzah, right? So the question is like, how is matzah freedom? And the chametz is like, you know, just full of itself. So it's very interesting. So Torah tells you like Judaism has a very interesting concept on freedom. Okay, so freedom is not the freedom to do nothing. You know, like a lot of us like, you know, freedom is I get to do nothing. That's what it really means. I get to do nothing. I don't want any responsibility. I do nothing. So you imagine if we lived in a world, right? Where everybody got to just do nothing. Then what would happen? Nothing would matter. You do nothing. I do nothing. I don't care what you say. You don't care what I say. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters because we're all just free to do nothing. <laughs> so Torah tells you, you, you go mental you wouldn't be able to stand it because you need, like we're wired to want to feel purpose. You know, you, you're wired to want to feel like you can accomplish. So what the Torah is telling you here is if the matzah wants to really accomplish, we want to really accomplish, then Hashem says, I'll give you Torah. Torah will give you freedom because you don't know where to put yourself. So Torah tells you, I can tell you exactly where to put yourself, right? And when you do these things, you're going to feel free. Like to me, Shabbos is freedom. Not because I sleep the whole Shabbos, because I try not to. I really don't like it, because then I can't sleep Saturday night, right? But what's the freedom of Shabbos? I get to really do what I want. What do I really want? Down deep, what do I really want? I really want a connection to God. I do. I really want to be in shul. I really want to be learning Torah. I really want to be with like-minded people and people who are loving and caring and good. I really want to be eating with them and talking to them and singing with them. I really do. That's what I really want, right? And when I sleep in the whole Shabbos, I don't wake up going, yay, I feel like so good. I was so free. I don't. Right. And I, I think everyone here, we can all feel free on our vacation, but not if it was the same thing for the next 30 years, we'd lose our minds. You know what I'm saying? So it's just an interesting idea. So this is another important thing that we have to think about. Like this isn't about, you know, uh, what enslaving us. <laughs> okay. This is about giving us the freedom to really be the soulful person that you were meant to be, you were wired to be, you have a piece of Hashem inside of you. This is what this time is all about. Hashem didn't take the Jewish people out of Egypt and then just go, hey, <laughs> said, I took you out of Egypt. I gave you a Torah so that you could really be free because otherwise you're going to be an animal. You're going to be lost, right? It's, it's very interesting. Like who remembers reading? I, I always talk about this. Who remembers reading Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens? Does anybody remember reading Oliver Twist? 
No, you didn't have to. Like so many of us had to. No, Talia, you didn't have to read Oliver Twist. Okay, so and when we were in school, that was like one of the classics you had to read it. So what was the story of Oliver Twist? It was like a like a really sad, horrible orphanage. And then all the boys like revolt. I want to get out of here. Get... And then finally, you know, these the people who run the orphanages, they're taken away because they were really nasty. And the boys get up the next day and they run outside. And then what happens? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they just don't know where to go and what to do. So it's like Hashem did such a bracha. He said, you're right. I took you from a slavery that bound you in a way that you couldn't think and you couldn't like, you know, that's what Hitler wanted, right? Arbit macht frei, right? You'll work so hard. You'll work yourself to death. You won't even know what you are. You'll be a nothing. You'll be a nothing. You'll have no time to think and no time to ponder and no time to anything. You'll be a nothing. I'll just make you a robot. And if you don't work, I'll kill you. You know what I'm saying? That's all it was, right? And that's what Paro did too. Hashem says, no, no, I'm going to take you to a place where you can do holy work, where you could work, right? With the Torah's agenda, right? And it will help you be the best you, right? You will get to be godly, on an earthly planet, you will take all this going to shopping and cleaning and getting rid of the chametz. Like there's philos, people say prayers when they're doing it. Like they'll pray, they'll say, please God, you know, all the chametz, which like, what do we say? Bread is very puffed up and full of, full of itself. They make jokes, right? Like, you know, you're, it's a proud bread, you know, like it's full of itself. So you know what, Hashem, like, take it down. I don't want to be full of my ego, like, while I'm cleaning. You know, I don't want to be full of my ego. I want to be, you know, clean of chametz. Help me to be a humble and kind person. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, as you're going through this, I have to find it. I, I saw somebody actually, um, a reach writer is a very famous speaker. She's a, a contemporary woman, very, very, very special person who has very bad MS, Okay, you're talking like people got hit over the head. This girl got hit over the head like I have never seen. She lost her business. She lost her pranasa. She like it was unbelievable. If you listen to her speak and you listen to her story, you just like want to go under the table bit by bit. You just can't hear it. But at the end, she's the queen of Amuna and Bitachon. It, it brought her to a new place. She used to be a caterer. Okay, she was a caterer. The whole catering business burnt down, right? And she didn't get a penny of insurance because she was holding the check for the insurance and didn't mail it. And was holding it in her hand, you know, like bizarre, okay? So she writes all these things. She wrote a prayer. She wrote a prayer for what to pray as you clean, <laughs> what to pray as you cook, you know? So I'm really, I have to find it. I was looking for it just a few minutes ago. And once I get it, Amir Tashem, God willing, I'm going to uh, put it up on the board because I just think it's like such a beautiful idea, okay? So let me just see if there was anything else that I wanted to tell you. I'm just going to look quickly. Yeah, this is like just, I like you to do just to, we have to memorize this and I'm not good at it, but I'm going to try. It's without Hashem, I can't, but without me, Hashem won't. So what does that mean? Without Hashem, I can't, but without me, Hashem won't. What does that mean? What does it mean? Come on, girly girls, tell me. Without Hashem, I can't, but without me, Hashem won't. What does it mean? If I can't do it without him, and if I don't ask for it, I'm not going to ah, get it. Ah, perfect. Okay. So that's what we have to realize. Because sometimes you're sitting and you're just like frustrated. Like, Hashem, I'm so mad. It's not working. I'm not getting this, and I'm not getting that. And Hashem is saying, ah, well, why don't you ask me for help? Like, don't just give me all your problems. <laughs> okay. You no, know, there's a, an expression, right? Don't tell God how big your problems are. Tell your problems how big God is. That's the point of Purim and Pesach. That's what you're supposed to be learning, that you have somebody you can lean on who is the superhero of the world. Right? So every time you get really frustrated, you start like yelling at Hashem, like, why not this? Turn around and say, Hashem, I just need your help. <laughs> okay, I need your help. I don't want to complain. I just need your help. Like, I'm going to lose it. You know, this is right. This is happening. That's happening. I really just need your help. Talia, yes, please ask a question. Uh, also that you're un undeserving of it. Okay. 
Right. Okay. So when we say this thing with the undeserving, I just like this, what we talked about on Shabbos and it's like the best thing in the whole wide world to memorize. Okay. It's like really every one of us, we need to memorize it, even though it's hard to see it. Okay. So here's the thing. Remember we said on Shabbos, Moshe is having this amazing discussion with Hashem and he really sees that this is a good time to ask some really intimate questions. So one of the questions that Moshe asks is why do good people suffer and bad people seem to prosper. Like, give me an understanding. So Hashem says, listen, I can explain some things to you. I won't be able to explain all, but let me explain some. So he says, the first thing I want you to know is that I am the God of mercy. Okay, that's the first thing. Everyone should just know I am the God of mercy. That's where I really operate from. That's the bigger picture. You may not see it because you don't know that big, 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 big end game, right? Because you just, you don't have the vision, you don't live in the past, the present and the future, but know that it's all mercy. And you know what? One special thing about my mercy is exactly what Talia said. I give it out for free. You don't have to earn it. So you don't have to always feel like, oh my gosh, like, but I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do this. Like, how would God be nice to me? I'm like pretty schmoey. You know why God will be nice to you? Because Amuna and Bitachon are the biggest mitzvahs in the Torah, right? So if you could have, like, just believe that he's merciful, right? Right? Like, it's, it's, it's hard. It's like, you know, like, uh, it's like they, they use this analogy all the time. Like when you take a little baby for their shots, right? They're screaming their heads up and they're looking at the mommy like, you monster, you know, you were always so good to me and so nice to me and so this to me, you're a monster, right? But re meanwhile, why are they saying you're the monster? Because they don't see the big picture. They don't realize that that shot is going to save their lives. And if they get rubella and measles and all these other things, they're in really big service, right? They're in big trouble. And so they don't see that, right? So Hashem is saying, I know you don't see it. You don't, because you can't. That's it. You physically can't. Just like that little baby. We could spend hours talking to this baby. And you know what this baby is hearing? Da, 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 da. The baby can't understand anything we're saying. Don't you realize we're saving your life? The baby's like, mm -hmm. okay, so that is like, I have to be real. So that was, that's, that's what Hashem was saying to Moshe. It's not that I don't want to. Just like the mother doesn't, the mother wants to explain it to the baby. But she can't because the intellect the separation is just too big. So what do we try to teach the child to do? As you keep getting older and older and you have this relationship with this child, you're trying to develop trust. You know, And that's why sometimes you'll speak to your kids and this will be your answer. Trust me. Like they're going, why, 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 why can't I go and hang out with this friend? And why can't I just, and why can't I sleep now? Not a good thing. <laughs> okay. Trust me. Right? You see what I'm trying to say? So this is like part of this whole game. So you're right. Like, and, and sometimes it's really tough. Life, you know, is it's a tough journey. It's a tough journey. But this is the point. Right now, this is the point. Right now, you have the spiritual energies out there that we could you know, cling on to that we could work with. Like you got to move up. This Purim can't be like last Purim and this Pesach can't be like last Pesach. Like you're trying to climb up. So what you want to do though is take that the spiritual energies that are out there, right? And say, you know what, Hashem, I got these like weeks and I got Pesach and I got Purim and I got to work on Amuna, Bitachon, Geula, right? And that I have, right? Like my freedom is my responsibility. My freedom is my responsibility. That is my freedom. That's where my freedom is going to lie in making Pesach, in doing these mitzvahs, in buying my new tablecloth or whatever it is that I want, right, to make my Pesach better. And then like really just to keep looking at that word responsibility means ability to respond. So not to under, you know, I'm too tired. Of course, I'm going to be frustrated. Of course, I'm going to pig out. No, it doesn't have to be that way. Shem is really telling you, I, you have the ability to respond. And you can be free. Okay, so now our good time to say the thank you prayer. So we're going to say that. Amita, you'll lead us, yeah? And I'm just yes. going to, okay, let me just shut this off. And I'm going to try to find that. Um, 